so this this work the the work that i'm going to present today has been uh, done by nikhil my colleague and uh, i'm presenting on his behalf i don't uh, claim to be an expert in formal techniques uh, and and so questions which are of that nature are best addressed to him and he'll be happy to answer those offline uh, on the other hand we can have a discussion on on the one formal implementation that i'm going to present and you know we can also take some of the more detailed questions offline and if time permits i'll try to do a demo on stage um, the demo which just started working yesterday uh, otherwise we could always take that offline as well to those interested uh, it's it's the demo of a linux uh, of linux booting on the formal model okay so to set some context under which this work was done, so, uh, so under the technical committee of the RISC-V Foundation, there are the technical groups, and this particular work was contributed under the aegis of the ISA formal spec, which works closely with two other technical groups, the memory model and the compliance group. Uh, the memory model is looking into you know, memory consistency models for the RISC-V processor, and compliance is trying to define a set of tests which tells you whether what you have implemented is a valid RISC-V processor or not. And both of these, uh, especially the compliance group, would probably be the first users internally of the ISA formal specification, okay, using it as a reference model. Uh, so this talk is going to talk about the challenges involved in you know, creating such a specification document, such a precise, and, and uh, how this particular technical group is exploring the multiple approaches. And uh, as an example, we're going to go into one particular implementation, uh, which has been written in elementary Haskell. Uh, and then that's going to be about half the talk, okay? So let's begin with, you know, what's the use of doing this? You know, why, why, why bother? So I guess the unifying theme is provable correctness. So uh, let's take two examples. So let, let's assume that you've got some form of CPU implementation. It could be a simulation model. It could be RTL. It could be some level of abstraction. And how do you know that it's doing the right thing when it executes RISC-V instructions, right? So how do you answer the question that, you know, will executing this RISC-V program give me the correct result and what is the correct result, more importantly? And how do I take, extend that to for all risk five programs? You know, so that's a very classical problem that this, something like this would try, would attempt to answer. If you up the level of abstraction further or you, you know, take the correctness question somewhere else, it would be, you know, you could, you could apply the same question to say the compiler. You know, how do we know that the compiler gives you correct risk five instructions? Okay, so, so this could be, you know, there, there are other users as well, but these are, you can, you can uh, sort of highlight these as two very uh, glamorous users of, of a formal spec. Um, answers to these are still some distance away, but, you know, we could start with some baby steps on how to use this formal spec, which is what we'll talk about. So, so let's define what is an ISA formal spec. Okay, so an ISA formal spec has to be clear, precise, and understandable to a human reader, okay? And preferably a human reader who doesn't have a PhD in formal techniques, okay? So that's mostly, in this particular hall, at least the engineers who are going to be designing systems. Uh, it shouldn't be cluttered with implementation considerations and unnecessary microarchitectural detail. And I will sort of shortly try to define what is necessary microarchitectural detail um, in a bit. Uh, and as I said, it needs to be accessible to the practicing engineer. It cannot be so obscure that, you know, you know eyes glaze over and you just say, okay, this is not for me. So, uh, it, but, you know, apart from that, it has to be precise and complete. We can't, we can't you know, uh, do away with that. You can't dilute the preciseness or completeness of the spec because then it ceases to be useful. Uh, it does have to be machine readable, so there has to be a parser which can probably take it to, uh, in a tool chain further along, which could potentially prove correctness and so on. Uh, 
being executable is definitely one approach as opposed to being axiomatic. So we have the, the particular specification that I'm going to show here is an executable specification in the sense that you can actually run RISC-V programs on it as opposed to just defining correctness properties. Okay. Uh, and uh, finally, it has to be usable with various formal tools. I mean, whether it's theorem provers, model checkers, verifiers, and so on. Okay, so an English language spec uh, usually doesn't meet these requirements. And, you know, there could be implementations of simulators like, you know, Spike, Scissor. Uh, Scissor happens to be a blue spec version of Spike, if you will. Uh, these can be regarded as specs, but they rarely meet all of the requirements um, of, of an ISA formal spec. So let's talk about uh, the challenges, and I've got three of these slides, and, and then we'll move into the actual code. So uh, I think the first challenge really is universality, right? The fact that the RISC-V is a vast and growing ISA in the sense that, you know, there are all these different extensions to the ISA which are possible. And any spec which claims to be complete uh, needs to sort of implement all of it, right? So all base instruction sets and every standard extension, all privilege combinations, all allowed implementation choices. Now that is when the, the, the third bullet is when it begins to get into slightly dangerous territory because we, it's how much of implementation considerations can you implement in a formal spec without bringing in too much microarchitectural uh, inputs in which will, you know, just muddy the waters, right? So, uh, so these are some examples of potential implementation choices, actually all of which needs to be implemented if you want to test a formal spec against an implementation. Uh, and at the same time, to be used for any, to verify a particular implementation, we need to be able to constrain the spec to meet that particular configuration. So, so there is this argument that it has to be extremely parameterizable, just like the spec, and at the same time, it has to be complete. And both of these are usually at odds when it comes to readability, okay? So that's, that's one challenge. So how do you keep it readable and consumable and extendable and all of those good stuff while allowing it to be still complete and extremely parameterizable, okay? The, the next challenge is extensibility in the sense that because of the nature of the ISA, uh, RISC-V, we have, you know, every, uh, every one of the various RISC-V foundations, technical groups are, are developing their extensions to the ISA and these all, eventually all the ones which are, which are officially blessed needs to find their way into the formal spec. So ideally this, the formal spec needs to be extendable by you know, the developers of these extensions, as well as anyone who is pursuing a proprietary extension might find it useful to you know, add that extension to the formal spec as well. Okay, so in that sense, it needs to be you know, easily modifiable or extended. And the last challenge, which is, in my opinion, the most, uh, actually, I, I think the most important, is the fact that it, it's to do with concurrency and weak memory models. Okay, so the naive view of the CPU is that of a sequential machine, right, which, you know, fetches an instruction, does the work, gives the result, writes back the, you know, modifies the state, and so on, and then repeats and repeats. Now, the, moment we, but most implementations are far more complex. You know, whether it's a single core, you, at the most basic level, it's going to have intra-heart uh, concurrency in the form of pipelining, in the form of, you know, the separate instruction and data fetches, uh, in the f and potentially out-of-order execution and, and so on. Okay, so how do you, how much of that concurrency do you model in the formal spec is a question. To keep it realistic, without getting too embroiled in microarchitectural decisions. Uh, then you have the vertical memory system co concurrency, which is TLBs, multi-level caches. You know, again, there is concurrency which is introduced because of having multiple levels of caching. Again, do you, how much of that do you choose to model? And then finally, the, the, you know, the most 
uh, often, often the most well-recognized one is once you introduce multiple cores into the picture. Okay, so horizontal concurrency. So, uh, and then the other dimension to this is weak memory models. So, as RISC V, uh, the, the, the technical committee uh, coalesces around weak memory systems, that opens up a whole different question to what is deterministic in terms of uh, you know, memory operations, especially in a multi-core system, right? So even in a single heart system, you need fences because your instruction and data, um, data uh, channels are, are independent. But the moment you get into a multi-heart system, just the very fact that you know a load can give you different results and they're all correct opens up a completely different question when it comes to what is a formal model supposed to bless is the correct answer, right? So it needs to have an ability to describe what a weak memory model is, okay? So, uh, so in a nutshell, the ISA spec, the formal spec must capture the allowed non-determinisms. And again, obviously, this is intention with simplicity and readability, right? So. This last challenge is still in the sense that the current formal spec, the way it stands, is a single heart uh, sequential spec. Uh, there is, it, it's a work in progress to bring in these elements, which, uh, and I'll talk about the schedule and the last slide, which hopefully should come in by the end of the year. So, uh, so the formal ISA spec technical group under which this was done, is addressing these challenges and there is no precedent in the literature for an effort of this magnitude on an industrial strength ISA uh, in the open domain, public domain. So there are, there are likely to be you know, proprietary implementations with the likes of you know, the CPU majors, uh, but those are all closed implementations. So in the open domain, there is no such thing. And so, which is why the TG is exploring multiple approaches concurrently. I mean, there is the approach at MIT. I mean, and, and the links in red are all, I encourage you to sort of access those links and play around with each of those. So that's in Haskell and it's connecting to Coq formal tools. Uh, the University of Cambridge and SRI, SRI International are working with SAIL and uh, BlueSpec's implementation is called Forvis. Uh, Clifford Wolf has gone and done one in Verilog, uh, rather brave. And, uh, and then there's an implementation at Galoa, which to my knowledge is not yet public. Okay, so we encourage you to like play with each of these. I will be mostly talking about Forvis. Uh, in my opinion, it's because of the elementary nature of the Haskell. I'm not a Haskell programmer myself. And my Haskell knowledge is all of three days old, so Bear with me. Although I do know BSV, which helps. Uh, just to reiterate, all of these efforts are free and open and are on GitHub. Um, and you're invited to download them and experiment with them. If it's Forvis, uh, we could do some of the experiments today, later, if you're interested. So the remainder of this talk, I'm going to be showing code. And, we'll be, uh, and I'll show examples of Forvis the elementary nature of the Haskell in which it's written, and uh, how the, it's basically has a simple one instruction at a time semantics right now, um, and possibly moving on to concurrent implementations of that. Okay, so the design principles of Forvis, who's, which is available up there, uh, it's written in extremely elementary Haskell, okay? It's like almost like the Python subset of Haskell, if you will, and, uh, it, and, and it, so it targets extreme readability in that way. It's uh, every, um, every instruction semantics is explained using a very simple mathematical style, machine state instruction, machine state function, okay? So it essentially manipulates the existing machine state because of the instruction and you know gives you a new machine state. That's it. There's no hidden side effects to any instruction. Uh, I can attest that it's fairly easy to read who, for, for those who do not know and may not you know want to learn Haskell. Um, part of the reason I'm doing this talk is because I fall definitely in that first category of that sentence. Uh, it it 
avoids Haskell features which are intimidating and unfamiliar to most people, like you know, type classes, monads, higher order functions, currying, and other such beasts. Uh, and it's, as I mentioned, it's practically a Python subset. Uh, the advantages of Haskell, which is why it was preferred over Python, at least by Nick Hill, is that because of its strong type checking and uh, better pattern matching. Okay, and uh, I know that you know it's always slightly dangerous to go into a language discussion, especially at the end of two days. But you know, we'll take the risk. There I said it, uh, and uh, there is uh, it's it'll be it's fairly trivial to translate say the Forvis code into say equivalent say Python code or maybe um, some other functional language. Uh, the the style of uh, the, the way the code is organized is in the classic one in the classic style of instruction set manuals, which is you know one instruction per page, and uh, showing the instruction, the legality conditions, and the semantics. And I'll, I'll give you an example of that. Uh, the the same code, the same spec, can be used for both sequential and concurrent readings of the ISA, and that's that's sort of an important point. So the idea is that. When we move from a sequential description of the ISA to a concurrent description later this year, this spec is absolutely going to remain absolutely untouched. The only thing which will happen is that the wrapper which uses the spec changes. Okay, so we will be able to build a multi-heart ISA spec by using whatever is already there in the code base. Okay, so this is uh, the much promised code. It's only one page really, I'm not going to go into more code though we'll spend about three slides on this. Uh, so this is an example of the JAL instruction, and in the future, you know, for those of you who are looking at or thinking about extending this, well, this is pretty much a template you will be following to add new instructions, okay? So, uh, so JAL is the jump and link for those who are unaware of it. And, you know, so the opcode for the JAL is a 0x6f, the instruction field is that, so that's the major opcode category. And then the next two lines, which is what's been highlighted in red now, that actually captures the function prototype of specifying the JL instruction, so that's spec underscore JL. And that takes a machine state and instruction as two arguments and gives you a Boolean which indicates whether the result, if it's true, it means that the instruction is a legal JL and the new machine state as a result of either a legal JL or an illegal JL, so pretty simple. So you give it a machine state as an input, you get a machine state as an output, and you have executed an instruction as a result, okay? And the machine state, you know, it, it's of type, uh, M state is, is of type machine state, instruction is of type INSTR, which is a 32-bit instruction in this particular case, and you know, the results are Boolean and machine state. So the first thing you do is you're going to go and decode the instruction. So for that, there is where you basically apply standard decoding function for the J-type encoding because the JL falls in the J-type encoding. So similarly, you have got four or five different types, broad types of uh, RIS-5 instructions, so you would have to apply the appropriate encoding type on this. And that's going to break it up into you know, the relevant fields for a JL instruction. And then you check if the decoded instruction is legal, okay. And then this block captures the semantics of the JL. Okay, so the semantics we use, uh, so because we want this to be readable and easy to modify, uh, there's explicit sign and zero extensions, uh, explicit conversions, nothing is hidden, nothing is meant to be mysterious, and we urge those of you who plan to extend this to keep, you know, to, to, to not sort of go off on their own and you know create esoteric code which only they understand because eventually this is meant to be consumed by everyone and hopefully become something or become one of the uh, specs which you would read to understand what RIS-5 ISA mandates, right? And then, so after the semantics, you essentially have a suit of standard finishes. Now you could, in this particular instruction, you could either you know, all could be well, and you could you could finish it, uh, and you know, uh, update the RD and the PC, 
or you could take a trap. So these are you know, two options. And in either case, these are captured in two functions. And uh, the final result is returned as is legal and M state one, where M state one is updated based on whatever finish condition, uh, finish um, uh, function was applied. And that's the training really. Uh, so every instruction which has been implemented follows the same template, no changes. Okay, so uh, you know as you look through the code and as you as you start uh, you know uh, getting familiar with it, you'll see that it's the same flow again and again and again. So this is really all the training someone needs to actually start modifying this spec. Um, a few comments, and uh, really I, I sort of couldn't resist this because there's a lot of uh, there is a lot of hidden subtlety to this. Even though you know what what we showed you is a fairly you know simple to understand single function uh, and and uh, this the subtlety is important because uh, as you extend the spec it's important to take care of all situations uh, so for instance in an instruction fetch uh, it's important to check that if you are fetching an instruction and it's a c it's a c standard execution which means that it's it's 16 bit instructions if you're two bytes away from a page uh, end of page because you don't so you have to fetch that first and then check if you know that traps or not and then decide to fetch the next Okay, because you don't want to have a trap which straddles a page boundary Okay, so so that's the level of uh, Detail that you need to go into especially if you plan to you know modify this so this is just an example uh, just to sort of call it out uh, Now uh, the last two points is something I just want to talk about which is to do with executing this uh, spec. So the spec as it's implemented is pure. Uh, pure in Haskell parlance over here means it is side effect free. Okay, it takes a machine state, it modifies the machine state and goes on. Okay, so there is there is no side effect of any of the uh, functions which are implementing any of the instructions. However, in order to actually run this and you know actually run a program through it, you need to model IO, you need to model memories, okay? And that is where the impurity comes in, if you will. And that has been captured through these wrappers, okay? These special execution wrappers. I will not uh, sort of get more into the Haskell-ish nature of that, but, but essentially that's where the, uh, the Haskell code has to, you know, deal with IO and the like. So, so currently we have something called the sequential execution wrapper, which is in the run program.hs which which is fairly easy to find in the source code. And tomorrow if we move on to concurrent execution, that wrapper would need to change, okay? And, and then there are a couple of ideas already which people are working on. One of them is to create a tree of instruction instances uh, to sort of model concurrency. Uh, but essentially what's going to change is just the wrapper. The core remains untouched, okay? Because how a JL works is not going to depend on whether you're running a sequential execution or a concurrent execution, okay? So none of the, um, none of the messiness of concurrency is going to find its way into the spec. It's going to be at the wrapper level. Okay, so uh, concluding, and these are the uh, status and plans. Uh, uh, so by the end of the month of August, uh, the plan is to sort of present complete core functionality which is the base ISA is 32 and 64i standard extensions, uh, the privilege specs, all of them, and uh, the major milestone being to boot the Linux kernel. And uh, the S by the way, the SRI uh, slash Cambridge models have already achieved this. MIT and the Forvis model are close to it, so I actually have a demo showing Forvis booting uh, Linux. Uh, and to deliver this to the compliance group, which is going to be it's the first major customer who is going to use it as a golden reference model. So, so today when you run the ISA tests, you typically we run it against Spike, you know, running it against Forvis becomes the, the thing the compliance group will move to. And Forvis can be something which can be maintained by the community, uh, especially the new 
um, new extensions which are added to the to the instruction set. Uh, by later this year, there'll be uh, the parameterization will be enhanced, especially with respect to CSR fields. Okay, because you know uh, when you have something like a WARL field uh, in the IC spec that is write any read legal, uh, what is legal, right? So that needs to be defined by the spec, by the ISA spec, uh, by the formal spec, saying that this is legal. So, uh, so that level of parameterization is going to go in, uh, maintaining readability. And you know, and, and the idea is uh, the final report on the sequential spec uh, is expected to be submitted at the, the, the December RIS Five summit. And beyond that is work on the concurrent version of the spec. And until the concurrent version completes, this activity can't be marked to be finished. And so the final aim of the of the working group is to deliver a concurrent, complete spec of the ISA. Uh, yeah, that's it. So. Any questions? Okay. So uh, basically, uh, what you're saying is that uh, you've uh, implemented a instruction, a RISC-V emulator. Well, uh, what we've implemented is a machine-readable interpretation, uh, machine -readable, readable interpretation but, of the spec. So what you have when you when you take the ISA spec, what you have is an English language document. Now that is open to interpretation. Yeah. What so we have done is, uh, what, what the group has rather done is that they have created an implementation of that text-based spec, but in a form which is non-ambiguous. It, 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 so it's a, a, a human readable emulator of the, of the I was thinking you could actually execute programs through it. Yes, it. yes, it's executed. Cool. It's, it's, yeah. So it's uh, 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 like a, 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 a readable version of Spike. Well, Spike is also human readable, but yes, it's, uh, it's meant to be unambiguous and clear. I think the, cl Excellent. the clarity and the preciseness is what, what is going, what we're going for. And yes, I can say, I can tell you that the JAL example, yes, is very readable. It's like, I, I've never done Haskell before and I can read it. Yeah, that's, that's, that's the whole point, yeah. yeah. Readable does not imply comprehensible. Uh, maybe, but I think I think that's but that's the aim. Definitely comprehensible, because otherwise, what's going to happen is maintaining this is going to become one group's headache, which is not. I mean, it's not going to work. What we would actually like to see is this becoming the default spec and the English language becoming a commentary on the spec, and that's how it should be. It should yeah. never start with English commentary. It should start with Forbes or something like that. And the English language spec is a interpretation, but not the binding interpretation. In case of doubt, you come back to the spec. Fair enough. Yeah. So uh, I just had one question. Yeah. Uh, so I understand the charter for the task group is to build a non-microarchitectural spec implementation. Uh, but I wanted to know that if, is it possible to take your spec, or your implementation, Forbes? And can I put in my architectural stage? Absolutely, you can. Uh, and I will just stop you at the first part. Is So you can't entirely avoid microarchitecture because of some of the examples I gave, especially with respect to memory models and things like that, right? Especially defining what is correct when you have multiple, uh, when you have a complex memory hierarchy. But yes, so to answer the first part of your question, yes, the aim is to be as much non-microarchitectural as possible, but you could take it and definitely you know, change it, yeah. Can I? Yeah, uh, just the last question now. Ne ne so when you're actually saying you boot Linux, is it on Haskell or do you generate C or? No, it's on Haskell. It's, it's on, on the Haskell, Haskell executable. So it is It is slower. Okay. It, it takes about, uh, it takes a few minutes, uh, like okay. about maybe five or six minutes to get to the, please press enter to continue. Okay. Thanks. So Neeraj, one question. Yeah. Uh, maybe I'm missing something. Uh, you asked two questions up front in your presentation which said, how do I know if my compiler is producing the right instructions and how do I know if my architecture is executing the right instruction, right? And then you showed a spec. I didn't see the connection between these two. How, how does that happen? Well, that's because the connection hasn't been established yet. So what, this, what, what I showed you today mm -hmm. is the part which is defining what is correct according to the ISA, okay. according to the ISA spec. Okay. 
okay? And what needs to happen tomorrow are the tools which will be able to say take, uh, if, you are, if you are able to take a state implemented at a lower level of abstraction mm -hmm. and a state implemented at the formal level, okay? Apply the same instruction and prove that the state change which has happened at the lower level and the abstract level is the same. And then by induction, you can take it that if you run any arbitrary program, that, that you know, it will hold, that property will hold. Now, those tools don't exist. I mean, that's, that's part of what they're feeding the spec into. Like in the case of uh, MIT, they're feeding it to Coq, where they're trying to sort of create those uh, proofs. But what, in order to do that, the first step is that you need an unambiguous, clear, and precise definition of what is a RISC-V ISA. Okay. And are there tools that link Haskell with Verilog? Uh, and have um, because you need that, right, to make the connection at some point. Presumably, yes. So I know that there are tools which link RISC, uh, Haskell with some form of hardware implementation. Uh, I can imagine it can't be too difficult to do it with BSV because BSV has the same semantics. But whether it's with Verilog, uh, um, I guess someone else Clash. would have to take that. Okay. Clash is there. Okay, so Clash. Clash is there, Fessy is there. Okay. Hey, one quick question. So if you take it logically to the other extent, that is if I, I can describe microarchitecture constructs, right? And treat this as a spec from a microarchitecture also. Because all said and done, uh, I may also want models for my microarchitecture. True, true. You could do that, yes. I mean, that's... I think, yeah. From being extended the wrong way. Yes, so that was actually what uh, Neil's first question was, that can you add microarchitectural constructs to this? Yes, yes, you could. But that's not the intent of this effort, at least. Thank you.